Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our lunch session. Hi. Uh, we're here today to talk about sex. And I'm just kidding. <laughs> just wanted to see their faces and what would happen. I've never been on a panel. Okay, so hopefully sex. everybody's got food. We have a, a great panel for you today, and we only have 50 minutes to get through it, so we're going to move quickly. Um, we're going to start. Everyone's going to take about three to five minutes just to tell you a little bit about their perspective. And then we'll get into the more interesting part of the dialogue. I have a few questions of my own, but I am going to open it up and make sure that you guys all have a chance to ask questions. OK? All right. So first up, our speaker, uh, Tom Paul, is the chief consumer officer at United Healthcare. He oversees all of United Healthcare's relationships with individuals. Um, he is actually a pharmacist by trade. So if you need any drugs, no? <laughs> Um, he's been about 30 years in the healthcare space, 20 years at United Healthcare, and for the last 10 years he's been working with the 50 plus market. So we're really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Tom? So good afternoon. I um, thought I would just do a quick update on uh, a little bit on United Healthcare. Um, United Healthcare is a benefits organization serving over 39 million individuals across the country. Of the 39 million, about 19 million are 50 plus. About 10 million are in the silent generation, those born before 1946, and about 9 million, just under 9 million, are in the uh, boomer population born between 1946 and 1964. Um, our Medicare uh, division, which serves about 9 million of those individuals, um, is pretty much a direct consumer health organization, um, which is a little bit unique. Most of the relationships in the healthcare space are through a group or through a, um, a government. Uh, these individuals come to us direct. It's about 95% of it is a direct consumer um, healthcare sale, um, of which we've seen significant changes over the years and are going to see drastic changes in that space as, as we move forward. There's a couple things that are really advancing that. One, um, as you probably uh, well know, the boomers have entered into the Medicare space. So they are starting to turn 65, and about 10,000 a day have a birthday that enable them to be now qualified for Medicare. Um, so that in itself is doing a huge shift in the volume of people that are eligible for Medicare. Over the last decade, it's been about 45 million Americans. You fast forward 10 years, it's going to be about 65 million. And that, that growth is also coming from a second component, which is they're living longer. So those baby boomer populations, there's more of them that are going to expand the Medicare space, but their life expectancy is going to grow, and likely they're going to be living with more chronic illness and more chronic disease which is gonna put a lot of pressure on them. But if you know the characteristics of the boomer, they're gonna want efficiency, they're gonna want effectiveness. Quite, quite honestly, what they're looking for, us and other organizations like us, is to make it simple, make it about them, understand them, make it personal, and then connect them to care, which really presents the challenges that we face going forward in serving this really uh, large or, uh, group of individuals. Now the other thing that's kind of shifting is um, the way in which they engage. Um, and so if you look in the past generation, most of the silent generation, especially when it came to making decisions about a health care plan, those decisions and those discussions really happened at the kitchen table. The vast majority of sales were coming from a sales individual going into the home and really having a dialogue over the kitchen table with an individual. That's now shifting, and people more and more are using technology to kind of advance that, um, the way they engage. It's also advancing the way they engage with health care in itself. And I just realized I haven't advanced any of my slides, so let me catch up. <laughs> I got so involved in trying to educate you all about the boomers. So um, I think, let me just go through here, and then we're probably going to get caught up. OK, so what we're seeing in that, in that boomer space is that more and more individuals are using technology to really engage um, not only the way they make decisions, but how they get themselves informed about health care and then ultimately how they realize healthcare. And let me give you just a few examples. So today about 72% of boomers are online. And the time they spend online is the most amount of time than any of the other age generations that you look at. And so more and more of them are engaging and using the internet, using the web, using social media as ways to kind of help um, engage themselves, stay connected within their own community. Uh, we've seen that in our own uh, membership. About 80% of our members now use the web use digital for some sort of engagement or communication with us. Now, once they become a member, once they purchase a plan, they're also using it for online engagement, communication, um, interaction with caregivers or family members that need to know about them. 
And so about a third of them are using social media as a way to engage and interact around their health and, and, uh, and, and ways to keep connected with the people that give them care. The other place that's really significant is really in how they're going to realize health. So again, traditionally, if I go back to how a sale was made, a sale was made over a kitchen table, now it's moving more and more by getting information over digital and then closing the deal uh, either digital by phone. When you look at health, it used to be realized in a physician's office, of which they were given about eight to 15 minutes per physician visit. And, now, uh, and then they realize it in um, over the counter with the pharmacy, which is the most common interaction of, of health in this population. Well, that's changing as well as the digital age takes place and consumer uh, technology <coughs> enables people to realize it in the comforts of their own home. Whether that be telemedicine, uh, United Healthcare has a, a, a now clinic in which you can basically stay in your home and converse with a physician um, or a caregiver that uh, can help diagnose uh, without you actually leaving the home. If you have congestive heart failure, which is a common uh, condition in an aging population, um, you can step on a scale um, and have your weight registered and sent to your healthcare provider. Um, or you can actually have a, a rash scanned and sent to your provider, so without even leaving your, your home, uh, through the use of phone, through the use of other digital technology, um, you can actually not have to go into the physician's office and still realize your healthcare. And these are the things that are really changing that face that help to make us more efficient and more effective in the healthcare space when it comes to serving that now 65 million uh, group of people uh, that are aging into Medicare. And so with that, I'm looking forward to having a dialogue with you and uh, engaging you with you around this important population. Thanks, Tom. OK, thank you. I'm back up. Good. So next up, we have Kevin Perot. Kevin's Senior Vice President at Quintic. Um, he is a technology. Um, has been around technology for quite a while, helped launch and grow companies like Sybase and Cambridge Technology Partners. Um, right now, Quintic has actually created a market uh, that didn't exist before. They have over one million uh, paid users, um, and they've created a health score that helps you understand uh, what your health is, is all about and be able to track it. Um, They've been uh, quite a sensation in Europe, and we're looking forward to seeing uh, the impact that they make here in the United States. Thank you, Jacob. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today, um, and thank you for that nice introduction. I only have about three or four slides, and what I'm going to do is talk at a high level about really what it is that we do. Um, show of hands, how many people here know what their credit score is? Don't worry, I won't embarrass anybody and ask you, ask you what it is. Um, you know, I bought a car recently, and uh, I shopped for the best rate possible. And then it occurred to me when I was getting evaluated by all those banks that they were all speaking the same language. They all had the same profile on Kevin, and they were all able to measure uh, my credit risk and credit worthiness um, just by looking at a simple set of metrics. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do that in healthcare? So what we did was we came up with a simple concept for health scoring. And what we realized that, boy, there's a lot of challenges in creating a score. One is you got to be able to pass muster with the actuarials at all the big firms that we buy our insurance, our insurance benefits from. Two, you got to get people to use it. You got to get people coming back and using it more and more and more. So it's got to be social. It's got to have elements of gaming. Um, it's got to be a lot of things. It's got to be relevant and useful for you because it's your score and it's not necessarily your insurance company's tool for deciding whether or not they want to offer you benefits. It's really your dashboard and it's a highly personal dashboard at that. So what we did was we developed a fun and easy to use tool. It's very social. Um, I, I would invite you all to check us out and open up a subscription and, and get in touch with your own health. It's free for 60 days. Um, and it's, it's a place that I, I describe it as looking a lot like Facebook online. Um, you surround yourself by friends who you help leverage to achieve your goals. It's a snapshot of, of your health anytime, anywhere, from any device. And it's a user, universal way of really uh, keeping track of how everyday activities affect your life in, or your health in a, in a way that's easy to track, benchmark, and monitor. Why do we need a health score? Um, for, for starters, it, it starts to educate us on what comprises good health. I'll tell you a real relevant story. I always make it about myself. Uh, my wife and I went on a destination wedding last year, and we went to Mexico. And she started taking fat-burning pills, wanted to look good in her bathing suit. Well, OK, I'm 
a man, I tell you, we like to look good in our bathing suits too. I started taking those fat burning pills. And what I noticed that because I'm plugged into a platform that helps me track my biometrics, takes me two, less than two minutes every day to track my weight, BMI, body fat, and, and blood pressure. Um, I watched my, my blood pressure go from a consistent 117 over 72 to 168 over 105. My next milestone birthday is 60. My dad had two heart attacks by the time he was 60 years old. It is just not a good idea for a guy like me to be inviting hypertension and high blood pressure into my life like that. Who knew? I mean, geez, I was looking good. My weight was coming down. I thought I was achieving my goals, and I realized there's more to my health than just what I see when I step on the scale. Um, I think it's, it's got to be useful. Um, it's got to be easy to benchmark and track. A score should be directional. It should give you real-time feedback on how the things that you do with your life every day, whether it has to do with exercise or, or, or what you eat, is affecting your overall health in a way that is easy for you to keep track of. When I log on to my score and I log on to my home page, I see my score up on the left-hand side and I see an arrow. It's either going up and that means I've been very active, I've been eating well and I've been doing all the right things, um, or it's going down. And I gotta tell you, when I look at my score and I see it going down and I see it falling, highly motivation, motivational for me to come back and start doing the things that keep me in good health because I'm hitting an age where it's really important and critical for me to pay attention and to keep track of all that stuff. It's designed to capture biometrics, but we're also designed, or a health score should be designed, to help you share everything that you're doing about yourself with the medical professionals who help keep you healthy. It's designed so that you can take it to an insurer like United, and they can get very prescriptive with you and help you achieve your goals. What we're trying to do is, is, is give the insurance industry, the uh, retail pharmacies of the world, mobile telcos, a way to keep engaged with us all on a daily basis. Um, and it should provide meaning to all the data that we collect. I mean, I, how many of you guys own Fitbits or pedometers or any of that stuff? I mean, if you're like me, I use those things like for about six weeks, and then I throw them to the, to, to kick them to the curb. And the reason why is because I can't tell you really what the difference between walking 1,200 steps a day and 1,100 steps a day really does to my health uh, over time. And what Quintic in, in a health score does is it gives you the ability to track that using biometrics, and you can drill right down to, wow, if my goal is to lose weight, um, week three of April, um, I lost four pounds, and here are the activities that I was doing. So what we try to do is we try to provide some meaning to all the data that we've been collecting with all these devices. I see the device guys at conferences all the time, and they always come up to me and they go, wow, you guys came out of nowhere, you've got over a million users, and the most interesting thing about your platform is people come back every day. And you know what? If you don't believe that, you can call BS on me. Go open up a subscription right now and, and invite your, your spouse, invite your friends, invite your family. Watch what happens next. You'll see them there every day. We show up every day because our friends are there. And we get, we get support and help from them. And that's a really compelling reason for coming back to a place like this. And it's good for us. Um, it, 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 we, we try to take into consideration who you are, how much you weigh, how tall you stand, um, what you do, the amount of exercise, the type of foods that you eat, and how you feel, because depression can have a profound effect on our overall health. And we make it relevant by giving you the ability to analyze how everything that you're doing in, in exercise, nutrition, uh, sleep, and stress is affecting your health in a way that's easy for you to understand and easy for you to take that information out to your doctors and medical professionals. Um, you know, I, I did my best to keep this so it wasn't a product pitch, but I, I can tell you some lessons learned from having a million new BFFs online with me, um, and they all do friend me. I'm like one of the founders of this company, and I'm, I'm the senior vice president of the, the highly visible guys. You get to actually track what my BMI was back in April. My wife likes to, my wife is president of a major U.S. healthcare company, and she likes to remind me that there isn't a woman in the face of the planet that's going to share that information with you. Um, and the important thing here is, is it's your dashboard. You don't have to share it if you don't want to. Um, it's for you, and it's for you to help you stay healthy. So one of the, a couple of the lessons learned. Here's what I would ad advise you to do if you're out there looking for a health, health score, and no, we won't be the only ones, but we are the first ones, and we are creating the market, is look for the ability to build your own network. 
I mean, my question to you is, if you work for Nike, if you work for SoCal Edison, and your company buys you a, a, a tool that's social and uses gaming, um, and, and you start to use it, um, here's what a behaviorist will tell you. You know, it's only so effective if you're only able to see what your coworkers are doing, right? Maybe you don't like your coworkers. I mean, one of my coworkers is here, and he, he'd tell you, sometimes he cares about what I do, sometimes he doesn't care what I do, but who does care is my wife. Who does care is my daughter, and who cares are my friends. So allow yourself the flexibility of being able to take whatever it is your company's gonna provide for you, and then build your own social network. You'll use it. I mean, it's just one of the behavior tips, tricks, and traps that we've learned. You gotta be able to share and analyze the data. One of the biggest challenges, I think, that the device guys face is that they're good at collecting things. It reminds me back at Sybase back in the day, we used to say, you know, databases are nothing more than a big wimpy storage cabinet. You know, until you start reusing the data in a meaningful way, what good is it, right? Um, and you need to be integrated and holistic. I mean, you see uh, this proliferation of devices and apps, and, and, and the one thing I, I always ask people, do you really want 13,000 apps on your phone? Really? I mean, you know, we, we can track 98 indoor and outdoor activities. It all hits the platform, hits your score, and allows you to be able to track how it's all affecting your, your body in a way that allows you to share it. Um, data collection only solutions will only take you so far. You'll get bored. You'll throw them to the, uh, on the counter just like I did. And, and I would suggest to you that you know, uh, member only or employee only solutions are limiting. Behaviorists, I mean, the guys that developed our score are brilliant. The guys that get people to use it are way smarter than those guys. They'll be the first to tell you, we act and we behave differently when we think people are watching. That's especially true if it's someone that we know and care about. So look for a tool that's your tool. Look for a tool that you can use to surround yourself with family and friends and you'll use it more. Buy the gadgets, buy the devices. I think with our platform you get probably about 15 or 20 already integrated into the platform, whether it's a pedometer, a scale, a few bin, you name it. If you're buying it, we're integrated into the platform so we can capture the data and you can use it. Looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't go over. So our, our next speaker is Victor Wang, who's the founder and CEO of Jerry Joy. His, um, his biography reads like a character, a hero from a science fiction novel. <laughs> he worked in uh, aerospace manufacturing, in oil sands, mechanical robots. After doing his master's at MIT, he worked on human-machine interaction, which I think means controlling robots with your brain. Uh, could be, yeah. I would love to do that. <laughs> it's a fantasy of mine. <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, I don't get much sleep. So, <laughs> uh, thanks. I'm Victor. Right. So our, our COO here, Dr. Jack Atzmon, is here too, if you want to talk later. <clears throat> and our, my email address is over there if you want to get in touch. Or please tweet us at jerryjoytech. And if you say the words, I want Jerry Joy, we'll put you in a draw to win a free month of our service. Uh, but before that, who here uh, actually takes care of an older loved one or provides care? Okay, cool. So I think in understanding market forces, it should start at a personal individual level. So I'm gonna tell you my story and why we're doing all this. So I was born in Taiwan and my parents brought my brother and I to Canada to grow up when I was very little. Unfortunately, we had to leave our grandparents behind. And so one of my grandmothers lives alone. And as I was growing up, she started to get really depressed. And in fact, when my mom was calling her up on the phone, they started to, like, she started to talk about suicide. And then so this started to cause a lot of big problems in my family, especially as I was growing up. My mom actually ended up having to leave us and go back to Taiwan for a year to help you know, spend time with my grandmother and make sure she's doing OK uh, mentally and everything. Thank God like everything's OK. It was just like she was really lonely. Uh, but then I, was, I realized like, there, there's got to be a better way. There has to be some kind of solution. So when I was doing my master's at MIT, doing human-machine interaction, it was uh, space telerobotics research for NASA. Uh, but uh, basically, I realized that I had the skills to create, using modern technology, a solution to this problem. And so I'd like to tell you about that solution. It takes the form of a virtual companion. Uh, so it could look like anything, right? Right now, it <coughs> looks like a talking dog, a really cute, funny, uh, a, lot of, a lot of fun, friendly talking dog that's smart. And obviously because it's a talking dog, it provides conversational companionship for your loved one all the time, even when you can't be around. And because it's a dog, it provides the emotional benefits that have been proven through pet therapy and even virtual pet therapy. Um, and all, all, obviously without all the hair and all the fuss and feeding it and going to the vet and stuff like that. 
Uh, but more importantly, we actually run these virtual pets with intelligent staff in the back, Jerry Joy staff. And they, so they deliver compassionate, intelligent conversation at a human level. And they talk about like family photos and things like that. And they actually, because it's a piece of technology and it's a virtual pet, we're freed from the limitations of flesh and blood. And we actually, our virtual dog, whenever he takes a nap, he dreams of this thing called the World Wide Web. And he can deliver information to your loved one, including family photos. And it works the other way around, too. He can send you reports about how your loved one is doing, what they've been talking about, and, and basically let you keep tabs on your loved one, even when you can't be around. And so this is how we address what my mother had to go through and what my family had to go through. And it turns out that it's applicable to millions of Americans. And it's a huge demographic, right? My mom, the, the term used to describe her would be in the sandwich generation, right? She had to take care of me at the same time, take care of my grandmother. So that's what we provide. This is what it looks like right now. Uh, he's just trying to shake your hand, like a little, a little <laughs> I want to shake your hand. Um, and over on the other side, he's showing a picture from family, right? It might be the great granddaughter or something. And he might say something along the lines of, hey, do you remember baby Susan? Uh, she just turned two this, this last week. She's looking forward to seeing you again tomorrow and start a conversation that way. And so here you can actually see it in action um, with a dementia resident at a nursing home which would be a typical user. So the younger baby boomer family member would purchase this for their parent. Um, maybe it's not going to play because. It's not playing. Well, OK, well, so you can go to our website. It's jerryjoy.com and just click the video. <laughs> but basically, he pets it, and it reacts in a really lifelike manner. Uh, it's all patent pending technology from MIT. And then, obviously, he talks as well. And it's, and it's human-driven conversation. So he, you know, he tells you that he likes it and that you're really good at scratching his head. And he's really appreciative of all the care that you give him. And he shows a picture of the family cat. And you can talk about, like, you know, what do you think we should call him and stuff. And then he can report back to the family, oh, your, your dad thinks that you should call him like Fluffy or something like that. Um, and basically, it helps to connect family and improve those family relationships, even with really limited time. So, and this is what the, the daughter of that senior you saw in that photo had to say. So she, she recognized, she, they called it Buddy, that's, that's what they called it. And she recognized that it helped to, uh, you know, not only improve joy and bring joy to their lives, uh, but also it, it gave his, her father a sense of responsibility, right? Which is really powerful for somebody in a nursing home that just gets taken care of. Uh, it actually gives them a sense of being able to care for a little, little creature that depends on them. So that really turns senior care on its head if you think about it. Um, so that's us. That's Jerry Joy. Uh, please do tweet us. And uh, really excited to be here and to find out what we're going to talk about today. So um, yeah, and do, if you think you could benefit from this, go to our website. There's, you know, there's a free week uh, for you to try it out. And obviously, if you tweet us, you could get a free month as well. So thanks. Our fourth speaker today is Robert Jaren. He's the Senior Director of Government Affairs for Qualcomm. He represents them on all US domestic policy issues around uh, wireless health and life sciences, and is also a frequent lecturer at um, George Washington University and Case Western Reserve. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I have no slides. I didn't want to bore everybody with slides. It's a very fast panel, so I thought that we could just get into the meat of some of the issues. Um, I'm coming from this from a very different perspective than uh, my fellow panelists because I'm a lawyer that works in the area of policy, regulatory, and legislative affairs, uh, particularly in wireless health and life sciences. Um, as you heard, I work for Qualcomm Incorporated, where the world's largest fabulous producer of chipsets. Um, we've produced over 8 billion uh, of those lovely devices uh, that go in phones and uh, smart, uh, smartphones, laptops, and other connected devices. Um, if you heard our CEO last night, he mentioned that um, every day, one million people come online, um, adding to the already 6.4 billion connections that are active uh, worldwide. And so for us, uh, connecting people is the most important aspect of communications. That's what we do, and that's what we do well. Um, living on that uh, paradigm, uh, we really embraced the area of wireless health um, uh, uh, proactively, uh, last year we launched a medical device subsidiary that works in medical device data systems and trying to 
uh, made that connection between medical devices and other health and, and wellness and fitness uh, devices. So we're definitely involved in the space. Now, why am I here and why am I speaking with you guys is because underpinning any aspect of any industry um, are federal and local and state uh, policies, regulations, et cetera. And in the area, this new evolving area of what we like to call wireless health, um, there's a lot of ambiguity, there's a lack of clarity, and I think that it's been quite confusing for folks that are coming from a very technical and technology perspective into an area that um, is really health, health-related, and even medical. Um, so having said that, why the 50 and over crowd is so important to us is because uh, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, 39 million adults um, fit that demographic of an older adult. And within the next 40 years, that number is going to um, over double. It's going to be 89 million. Um, around the world currently, we have about 500 million people that fit that demographic. And the same deal, I think by 2040, they're expected to have 1.53 billion people that fit that demographic. So, the folks that are 50 now are definitely going to get older, uh, obviously. Um, there's uh, an incredible um, mounting body of evidence that people are living longer. Um, the Lancet Journal came out with uh, a finding of about 150 researchers, um, which were all working with the Washington University and Harvard University School of Health, um, where they um, discovered that um, men, on average, have increased their life expectancy by about 11 years women on average by about 12 years, but they're also living with much more um, health disparities and disability, unlike ever before, which means to me that that's just an opportunity for innovation, that's an opportunity for healthcare and wellness. Um, but with that opportunity comes a lot of this stuff that I was talking about, and one of the biggest obstacles to adoption, in my opinion, um, is this aspect of reimbursement. Um, why? Um, it's not that the industry is looking for a handout from the government and that suddenly CMS tomorrow will turn around and say, here, industry, here are billions of dollars for you guys to get reimbursed on. Uh, I don't think that's going to work. It obviously hasn't worked. That's what we call the fee-for-service model. Um, but what I think will work is that as CMS changes that model and looks at things like clinical quality measures, um, you know, better health outcomes, um, you're going to see doctors and hospital systems shift away from fee-for-service and actually start buying products which are smart, which are connected, which actually give them data from human beings that they can hopefully, will be hopefully useful in their delivery of care. And that's a really important aspect. So for example, the Office of the National Coordinator uh, a few years ago, empowered by the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, um, has about $19.2 billion worth of money that they're going to define how uh, doctors, eligible providers, hospitals, et cetera, will meaningfully use health information technologies and very specifically electronic health records. Unfortunately, missing from that is that vast ecosystem of medical devices, medical products, uh, wellness products, et cetera, um, which will actually touch a human being. So they're incentivizing the use of electronic health records and electronic health record systems, but not really incentivizing the rest of that ecosystem that, I, that I'm talking about. Uh, and that's a very significant thing. So through the different stages of meaningful use, they've been getting closer and closer to actually talking about patient engagement in a, in a useful way. And when I say useful, I mean by actually involving patients. Patient engagement has been a part of their meaningful use process from the beginning. But only now, in stage three, are they really talking about how can we get patient data, patient-generated data, and upload that into the electronic health record. That's an important thing, because as they do that, this aspect of the, of the industry and the folks that are working on many of the things that you hear today will start actually getting some traction, and hopefully doctors and other care providers will adopt those things. And with that also is this aspect of the care providers themselves. A lot of people that are care providers are like, like you, you know, like myself, who have um, people that are sick at home who, uh, who need some help. Uh, so we have to actually engage them as well. Uh, so my comments today are going to really be around the policy, the regulatory and legislative aspects of some of the things that we're all working on, and you know, I, welcome, I welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So it's market forces at play. I wanted to start by asking you, what's the single decision that's had the biggest impact on your bottom line when you've thought about how you're going to use technology to engage with this, with the 50 plus audience. Tom, why don't we start with you? Well, I think the biggest thing is this misperception that the 50 plus doesn't connect digitally. Um, so I think it was a, 
coming to that realization that people are very connected. Now, what they use the connection for can differ by individuals, by various populations. Um, the most common seems to be a connection point, so a connection to family members, connection to friends, um, you know, staying connected that way. Um, but I think more and more are drifting to uh, 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 using digital as a source of information, a, a way of evaluating uh, uh, health conditions, getting information so that you can be prepared when you go into your doctor's office, so that you can be prepared when you go visit your pharmacist. Um, so I think more and more are shifting um, to using it for more than just connectivity. And I think that um, recognition and that understanding, because again, when you're serving a, a population of the size of that, that 50 plus population, um, you need a way to be able to stay connected to the individual, but it has to be efficient and effective. And so I think that, that has been a, a, a really good point for us to follow. Yeah, so have you incorporated social media actively into the way UHC engages with your consumers? We do. Um, so we've got, uh, and, and actually we've had a, a significant growth over the last year of people who uh, follow us on Facebook, they in, interact with us through, uh, through Twitter. Um, so we're, we're getting more and more engaged. Um, we are seeing a bit of a hesitancy of consumers um, kind of reverting to that being the sole source of communication. So for many individuals, and there's been a lot of studies both at United Healthcare and uh, within the general industry that would say that whereas consumers are still seeking information that way, they still want a personal connection. And so they're still picking up the phone um, or actually doing face-to-face -to, -face to actually um, at some point within that connection. And so we're still um, seeing uh, and, and leveraging that a lot of, the, of that human connection. Because when it comes to health, there's still that, that human touch involved in it. Yeah. Kevin, how about you guys? Um, I, I would concur. I, I think, you know, I'm going to say something provocative, and that's I'm ready to declare dead the myth that people aren't willing to be accountable or responsible for their own health. They've never seen tools like this before, and we're really at generation 1.0, I think, of this whole move to mobile health and how it affects us in a personal way. Um, we, uh, we believe it does have to be social. Um, it does have to be fun. But it's got to be meaningful. You've got to be able to take it, as Tom said, and take it into your doctor, take it into the medical professionals who help you achieve your goals, whether that's managing a chronic condition in your senior years or just trying to stay fit and active throughout your entire life. Um, what we try to do is we try to provide people with a platform that they'll interact with every day because it's fun and it's useful. And what we try to do is we try to sell through and partner with folks who can get highly prescriptive with you to help you manage that condition. In an ideal world, um, we got to a million users in Europe uh, very quickly by partnering with the two largest insurance firms. And they looked at our uh, product and they said, you know, you've developed something that really hasn't existed before, and I'm not just talking about your score. It's a place where people come every day just to check in on themselves and to check with their health. What you don't do is you get prescriptive with them and help them manage their conditions which is where your insurance provider and your insurance carrier comes in. So I, I think that you know the fact that there's 13,000 apps out there, the fact that the device guys just can't keep up with production and keep selling, 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 is very indicative of the fact that we're very curious about ourselves, we're very curious about our health, we want to take a more active role in, in how we manage it, we're uh, uh, absolutely voracious about learning new ways to, to manage blood pressure and all that. We've just never really had the interactive tools that we, uh, that we have today. So I would describe Gen 1 as now we're, we're interacting, now we're collecting, and I think Gen 2 is going to be, all right, now we're marrying that with partners who can help you get highly prescriptive, whether that's the Joslin Center in, in Boston with you know, helping you manage diabetes or, or just you know, hypertension or whatever. Um, and that's where I think the, uh, that's where the world's going. And I, I like ACOs in the healthcare delivery system. We like to joke that the trains left the station. I think with health scoring, uh, the trains left the station as well. Victor, I'll ask you the same question. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, I don't remember the exact wording of the question, but I, I interpreted it as how did we segment the market in order to improve the business? Well, when you, when so, you were sitting down to design the technology yeah. and how it interfaced with them, what, what what single choice, if you can, if you settle on one or two critical success factors that you think are having the most impact on your bottom line? 
Yeah, so basically what we've done is we've separated out. There's two, 50 plus is huge, right? So there's, there's two separate types of people within the, the consumers that we work with. So there's our actual customer, who's like a baby boomer. And then there's our user, who is a senior who's 80 plus potentially with mild to moderate Alzheimer's, you know, living alone or in a nursing home. And those are, that's very different from the 50, 55 year old tech savvy baby boomer, right? And so one of them is our customer, one of them is our user. And so it's very important to understand that and we design around both of them, hmm. right? So for, for our user, we assume absolutely no technical skills whatsoever and obviously we go in um, and we've done all these user testing um, trials and at senior care facilities, actually at nursing homes and it's just living facilities. And we've built this tablet based, it's an app really, mm -hmm. is what it is. But we've made it so that it requires absolutely zero technical skills for this 80 year old person with dementia, for example. And we actually like hide the tablet's buttons. So you can't even like, if you just feel around randomly on the screen, you can never exit the app. Mm -hmm. And it's just always plugged in 24 seven. You literally, to the senior, they don't, even if they don't understand anything, it's just a friendly little companion. It's a talking dog that happens to live inside a picture frame. And that's it. And that's, that, that's what we've created for them. Uh, understanding that, you know, they're not very tech savvy. But then realizing that this, like I like how Tom was talking about how, you know, these baby boomers are actually increasingly tech savvy and they'll go on Facebook and things like that. And so we leverage that and we have this thing called the family portal, hmm. right? And so that's their primary interaction with the companion. So the, what happens is the, we look at the little dog, right? The companion actually writes these first person like log entries, like a diary and it gets reported on this family portal where, where our subscribers can see, like, it's like the diary of the dog and everything that happens in the dog's life. And of course that involves to a great extent mm -hmm. their loved one, right? And it talks about what they've talked about and how, the, how their loved one is doing. And so they can keep up with what's going on in their life that way, um, even, even if they can't be around every day like we can be around. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then that's really powerful because, you know, these, these baby boomers, they like to go online, they like to keep up with what's going on, but they can't with their older loved one because they're not on Facebook. Right. So this is that avenue. Um, and if it's just like Facebook, they can put up pictures, except these are like family-oriented pictures that the, the, the younger person knows that their older loved one um, will recognize, yeah. or like, like an old hobby or an old photo from wartime, or, or a picture of themselves if they wanna just reinforce their own face Right, for mom or dad who might be starting to forget people in the family. Um, and so, so it's, it's like a very personal yeah. <laughs> uh, Facebook and it like reflects the fact that you know, baby boomers are online and they like to go online, but this allows them to do it in a very personal way with their older loved one who has zero technical skills. I wanna ask you about the emotional aspect there because pets are a real emotional lodestone, yeah. right? And so do you ever get any sort of guilt on behalf of the caretakers that this is what they're, that, they're, that now their loved ones are spending time with this? Yeah. Or, and or on the other side of that, do you see the kind of bonding that happens between families and pets? Do you see like a deep emotional entrenchment where Buddy yeah. becomes almost a part yeah. of the family? So it's, it's not a replacement for spending time with mom or dad, right? <laughs> it's an augmentation, it's complementary. So, so really what happens is in addition to like regular visits, and in fact, I think people tend to visit more when there's Buddy because it's actually kind of interesting to like go and like talk, talk to this little, little dog and it provides like something to talk about, right? For you know, even during the visits. Uh, but besides that, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I think it increases overall interaction because in addition to the regular, like, you know, you visit once a week, for example, you have this additional thing where you can, you spend 10 minutes per week to upload some new photos, mm -hmm. comment on some photos. Um, check the family log, uh, and then that, that 10 minutes is leveraged by our staff that run the conversation behind the companion into literally like hours every week of family-oriented conversation. So it's, it's an increase and an improvement, not like a replacement for, <laughs> for visiting. I guess that's what you meant. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, I, you know, I've been sitting in all these sessions and I haven't heard, you're the first person I've heard mention electronic health records. <laughs> it's within the context that's, of where the government honest. is focused with their billions <laughs> hang of dollars. Should more often. <laughs> yeah. So how do you, I mean, all of these things that we hear people talking about, how do you see government, I, I imagine them like a black hole reshaping the path of light. Like how yes. do you see their, what they're doing in their pot of money 
yeah, impacting all this. It's unfortunately a, a very insular wells that they've created of these different uh, technological worlds. Um, electronic health records, you know, through an act of Congress, are the ones that are being focused on by the Office of the National Coordinator. Hmm. And if, if folks don't realize that, I think they're going to learn that very quickly, especially the providers. They, there's a carrot and a stick there. The carrot is you will get a financial incentive by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services if you're an eligible doctor, an eligible hospital, et cetera, a care facility, um, when you can prove that you have actually uh, achieved some, sort, some level, there's different levels, there's stage one, stage two, stage three, um, some level of meaningful use. When you have used an electronic health record that's certified by an ONC body or an electronic health record module, you'll receive some money from the government. Up to 44000 for an individual doctor that's a Medicare doctor and up to 63750 for um, a, a doc that deals with Medicaid. Wow. Okay, and then millions if you happen to be a hospital because you know, they, they load up all the docs. That's the law that is being rolled out. That's what's happening. If you don't embrace this technology and you don't become a meaningful user, you risk losing all your Medicare payments down the road. Not, no aspect of that, in my view, deals with these technologies, really. Um, and that's the unfortunate part, because if they were to incentivize the use of these types of technologies, these types of tools, you'll have doctor adoption. Doctors were re very reticent in adopting EHRs, but now they're all beginning to adopt the EHRs because they're going to lose that carrot. No one wants to lose the carrot. But when it comes to these, these technologies, they're not in that picture, so they're not being picked up, and they're not being adopted. And that's an issue, because when we talk about adoption, it's not just the patient that has to learn this world, this, this tool that's going to help them achieve certain health status and hopefully get them you know, to be a little healthier. But it's also the care provider at home and the care provider in the back end system, which includes docs. Many docs don't live in this world. There are a lot of forward thinking docs that have embraced this, but there are a lot that haven't. And that change of paradigm is a very important thing that I think the industry has to focus on as well as the, the healthcare industry. Yeah. And unfortunately, these insular wells that Washington is creating isn't really embracing that. Now, I'm not beating up on ONC. I'm not beating up on CMS. ONC has definitely tried to do some stuff. They've had a lot of app developer challenges. They're, they're definitely talking more mobile. They're talking about mobile security in the context of these types of things because they realize that doctors are, ex uh, are beginning to use smartphones and, and, and you know, iPads and tablets. But um, that incentive is a big, big leap. They, they need to really proactively incentivize as well. I think we have a question or something. Yeah, we have a, it's time to wrap up. <laughs> yeah, we lost oh, wow. some time. We lost some time on the lunch. <laughs> as opposed to being, a question. We just gone. started. I'm sorry. It, it, it's been, everything's been moving rather quickly, actually. Yeah, yeah. So um, we, we really, we have, we, unless you have one word comp wrap up from everybody, we're at time. And I couldn't get you because I was behind you, sorry. It's okay, I understand. Well, thank you very much yeah. for your time. So can you guys help us thank this fabulous panel?